Hello, I'm Dustin Erdosch here at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig, Germany. Together with Dr. Susan Hanisch, we'll be helping you explore our teacher education module, Human Behavior and Sustainable Development. These videos are meant to supplement our live in-person course at the University of Leipzig and also to allow our virtual students and interns from around the world to follow along and engage the resources and develop projects at your own interest. We're here to help, so just get in touch if we can uh, help you understand or connect into some of the resources in the course. And so now, let's begin. Welcome to the Teacher Education Module, Human Behavior and Sustainable Development, Week 1, Evolving Schools. I'm Dustin Erdosh, and together with Dr. Susan Hanisch, we'll guide you on a journey through the resources for this module to explore the theme of human behavior as an interdisciplinary topic across different subject areas for different ages and, and target students. You can download these slides through the module that we'll also give you an introduction to today. We're based at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology here in Leipzig, Germany, which is known worldwide for our research about human behavior, cognition, and culture. Our institute is interested in the origins, diversity, and flexibility of humans. That means we're asking big questions like, where did humans come from? How similar and different are we from each other? And what's our capacity for change? And we do this not through one single method, but through a wide range of methods. So we look at our closest relatives in the great apes, non-human primates. We look at how children develop across their ages and across cultures. We look at genetics and archeology. span We look at human behavior cognition and culture across the world. In our specific department, that of comparative cultural psychology, we're interested in the psychological capacities for cultural adaptation. So when we think about where did humans come from, how similar or different are we, and how, what's our capacity for change, our capacity for culture seems to be at the center of this. And so we're interested in what are those mental capacities that enable the kind of culture and cultural change that, that represents our human unique species. And again, we do this by looking across species, across cultures, and across the development of individual lives. And specifically within this department, Susie and I have developed two labs to help with educational innovation, our community science and educational design labs. These are focused on developing school-based projects in Leipzig and internationally that you'll learn about and have an opportunity to engage with. We're focused on cultivating an ecosystem of international education innovation networks that I'll introduce you to in a moment. And we have a strong emphasis on teacher education supports, helping ensure that uh, future teachers and educators of all kinds have the tools, concepts, and skills needed to give students the skills they need to engage in, in 21st century challenges. As I said, a big part of what we do is cultivate an ecosystem of education science and innovation networks. If you download these slides, you can click on any of these logos to get a better sense of, of some of the different partners that we're connecting. What, how, what all of these organizations, networks, and institutions and projects have in common is that they're looking at human experience, the, uh, the human condition, as an interdisciplinary theme for understanding the world. And whether it's focusing on intelligence or cooperation or evolution or music or sustainability, we can look at these human experience concepts and think about how these connect across disciplines and across uh, how students of different ages can come to understand what it means to be human in today's world.
Specifically, this module, Human Behavior and Sustainable Development, is the, is the first module and the core module for our online learning platform, OpenEvo. So OpenEvo is a dedicated Moodle server for interdisciplinary teacher education and innovation. And it's also a collaboration hub for these model scientific communities, as well as a platform for student project development. So that means we're working with current and pre-service teachers, scientists, as well as students of different ages to develop new ways of thinking about evolution, human behavior, and sustainability as an interdisciplinary subject area. You'll notice that we have two websites, openevo.eva.mpg.de is the main project website, which has information about the origins and, and interests of the project. Uh, but of particular interest here is our learning hub, which is openevo-learninghub.eva.mpg.de. And this is the dedicated Moodle server, uh, which I'll show you in a moment. And so this is the link to the, to the current module and the, uh, the enrollment key that you'll find. So let's look into what this looks like on the Moodle. Once you have enrolled in the module, you'll log in and find this entry screen. Here you'll find a general forum where you can post any questions or discussion topics. Here you can, uh, we ask you to read and, uh, and mark your selection for the educational research participation consent. That is, we're constantly trying to improve this module. And so this is part of an educational design research project where we can work to improve how teachers can understand human behavior. And therefore, we like to uh, use student work anonymously to try to improve how we're teaching and what students can get out of the module. Next, you'll find the module syllabus and then some main readings. For those uh, um, in Germany, we will give you some printouts. You can also order uh, the printed teacher's guide through, uh, through this link here. For project group work, we ask you to sign up to a project group. Uh, if you're a virtual student, you may or may not be choosing to engage in the virtual project group. You may be just following along for your own interest, and that's fine, so you don't need to do that. Um, but anyone who is interested to work in project groups, if you are having difficulty, just connect with us, and we'll help you connect into a group. Uh, and for those in groups, we have this group work portfolio document. And this will be this will help you keep organized and work together as a group towards that final project that I'll explain in a moment. Then down here you have the actual course content. Now these tabs will be largely uh, uh, accessible only each week. Uh, for those following along virtually, we'll generally try to record the video like this after the Thursday live module. Uh, and we will try to make all of this then available as soon as possible. So you'll see here week one, we've already asked and most of you have uh, conducted this evolving schools survey. And you can see here is this link to this presentation. Um, and the only assignment for this week is if you're going to join a group, you, you should begin to sign up with that table. Let's look a little bit more into the details of what this module is about. The learning goals for this module, that is what you'll be able to do by the end, is understand important concepts and principles of behavioral and sustainability science. You'll be able to understand the learning potential of teaching for conceptual understanding and transfer of learning of these core concepts in behavioral and sustainability sciences. And lastly, you'll be able to develop, present, and evaluate a unit that integrates learning goals from your future curriculum, as well as concepts of human behavior and sustainability, and one that allows students to understand and impact 
diverse real-world sustainability problems. The main readings for this module come from our Teacher's Guide to Evolution, Behavior, and Sustainability Science, as well as our Community Science Field Guide for School Culture. Further information and teaching materials are currently available in English and in German on the websites here, Global ESD and Evo Leipzig, and we'll have other recommended readings within the Moodle in that course, course content. This provides an overview of the, of the module. So we're beginning this week with Evolving Schools, which we'll discuss in just a moment. Next week will be educational Education for Sustainable Development, an introduction to this global movement to reform and innovate education to meet the needs of the planet and individuals. Then we'll begin the kind of conceptual exploration that is the core of the module. So we'll be looking at evolution, behavior, and sustainability. Then we'll be looking at the relationship between sustainability and cooperation and sustainability and our mind. And then we'll think about this idea of evolving the future. Then you'll have uh, an extended period of time to work within your group or individually to develop your own project based on what we've learned. And week 15, we'll have final discussions and reflections. Assignments and grading. So we have an emphasis in this module, not on accuracy of content, because in fact, much of what we're discussing doesn't have a particular correct answer because we might be talking about complex scientific controversies, uh, the edge of human knowledge. And so uh, rather than quiz or, or test you, uh, we're focused on formative assessments. So while we do have some quizzes or checking for knowledge, these are not graded uh, based on your performance, but just as a way for you and us to know uh, what is your current understanding. Um, however, we do ask that you complete these uh, these assignments uh, as part of getting credit for the course if you're if you are trying to get credit through the University of Leipzig as opposed to virtual students or interns that may be taking this uh, outside of the university context. So individual assignments, uh, reflections, quizzes, and surveys make up 35% of the grade and project group work uh, including the group work assignments and the unit plan make up 65% of the grade. Project group work, this is really the, the uh, central aim is to engage you in not just the ideas, but also a practical output towards uh, usable unit lessons and guides. And so Generally, what we do is have you form groups of six to eight students until next week. You'll document regular discussions in a project group portfolio, as I showed you the link just now. And then you'll work on your final project, which is to develop, present, and evaluate a unit that integrates learning goals of your future, future curriculum, as well as concepts of human behavior and sustainability. This final unit template is new for us, this module. We've, we've adapted it based on a teacher education community that we're a part of called Learning That Transfers. And uh, so you can link to that template at the link below here. And this is a basic guideline to help you organize uh, some of what we're learning over the course of, of the semester. Finally, as I mentioned, this is part of educational research. And so we ask you to please read the consent form and select uh, select to indicate if it's okay for you to, to contribute to this. All data is always anonymous, so your name will not uh, be associated with any work and uh, giving consent has no impact on your grade. So we hope you'll join us as part of this ongoing research effort to, to improve education globally. Now let's shift gears. Let's look a little bit more in depth at one of the two core labs from our for our module. This is the community science lab that we've developed over the last two plus years here in our department at the Max Planck Institute. 
So this, we call this the community science lab for the understanding of humans. And here we're focused on a really big question. We want to know how can students and school communities engage scientific perspectives on human behavior as a foundation for the participatory improvement of their own school? So often schools increasingly are seeking ways to empower students to engage them in different aspects of, of school improvement or uh, school culture. And we think that's a really good and important trend. Uh, but often students and even teachers do this without reflecting on the current state of knowledge or different kinds of scientific perspectives that may or may not be helpful in uh, in advancing the kind of school that that students feel will be helpful for their future. So what we're trying to do here is make a connection between these processes in which students are empowered to improve their own school and also processes where students are learning about the science of human behavior and the science of human learning itself. To advance these aims, we've developed a few kind of sub concepts. So one thing we've developed is this idea of students as community scientists. So as part of our community science lab, each week we've been meeting with a small group of uh, now 10th graders, uh, but we've actually been working with them since they were in eighth grade. And so we work with them to develop small community science research projects where they use simple scientific methods to engage in research and perspectives on uh, culture, behavior, and cognition of their school community as it pertains to issues, big issues like climate change and uh, more local issues like the school curriculum. The aim here again is to help students and the school community to understand and influence the cultural evolution, the cultural change of their school communities. And in this way, we're beginning to th think about schools as field sites or community-based field sites for applied cultural evolution. So what does that mean? Well, in the social sciences, in anthropology, and other social sciences, as well as in biology, a field site is any place of scientific interest. It's a place that scientists are trying to understand. And so when scientists try to understand a, a place, when they try to understand a field site, they may study it in depth, often for long periods of time. And so what we're suggesting and what we're working towards is to help students become community scientists studying their own school as a field site, a place of cultural change, cultural change that is sometimes influenced by scientific perspectives, sometimes influenced by not so scientific perspectives, influenced by other cultural or intuitive uh, beliefs from the different people that come and make up that school. And so what we're trying to do as a whole is give students some simple scientific tools and theories about the nature of change, the nature of individual and social learning, and how we can actually think of schools as places to for continuous improvement towards the individual and also shared goals that we all have. So to make these big questions, these big ideas concrete, the first project that we've developed in the Community Science Lab is called Evolving Schools. And here we're asking a more focused question. We want to know, how do school stakeholders, that is, how do students, parents, and teachers think about the purpose and functions of schooling? That is, how do school stakeholders like students, teachers, and parents, how do they think about what is school for and is it functioning towards those purposes is it working we can ask questions like how should schools and curriculum be designed now and in the future and on what theories or beliefs do people base their theories of schooling and so that's 
the last big concept of this project is the it, it, this idea of theories of schooling, which means simply this. Scientists work to study what kinds of schools might be effective, and so scientists develop their formal theories of schooling, scientific theories of what makes a good school uh, uh, work. And different scientists may have different opinions, um, but we can identify something that that is more scientific in nature. But of course, scientists are human beings, and before they've engaged in scientific training, before they've engaged in scientific research, they've had beliefs, hypotheses. And so it is, in fact, all humans that are exposed to school, which is basically all humans on the planet, with very few uh, remaining exceptions of hunt, some hunter-gatherer communities. Um, almost everyone has been exposed to school. Most of the planet is now going to school. And so all humans, almost all humans, have uh, some kind of intuitive or folk theory of schooling, uh, a set of beliefs, attitudes, knowledge about what they believe uh, makes a school work, what the purpose and functions of schools are. And so with evolving schools, what we're trying to do is characterize these cultural theories, these ethno theories, uh, or simply theories of schooling. We want to try to understand how do students and teachers and parents think about, about what makes a good school and how can we connect that into these processes of school improvement. If you haven't done so already, please go to week one, Evolving Schools, and fill out the Evolving Schools survey, and then come back to this video, and we'll go through the discussion. Now that you've completed the survey, let's look a little bit further into what this project is about. In evolving schools, we're trying to think about school improvement as a complex cultural evolutionary process. That means we think about how schools improve as a kind of complex system in which uh, culture is changing in, in different ways that we can think about scientifically. So what exactly is evolving? Well, on the one hand, we've got these school design elements. So that means teaching practices, social norms, attitudes, beliefs, institutions, community relationships, as well as curriculum content and relationships between content or subject areas. So some schools may have a strongly interdisciplinary curriculum. Other schools may have strong boundaries between them, and this may or may not change over time. We call that evolution of school design elements. And this is evolving in relation to what we describe as theories of schooling. So again, these could be scientific or quasi-scientific or any diversity of ethno uh, or cultural beliefs about the purpose and functions of school. Importantly, when we think about these theories of schooling, when we think about what is school for, this also draws on theories of human nature, theories of human development, and theories of cultural evolution. And so that means, again, we can have scientific theories, uh, so we can use scientific methods and scientific perspectives to try to understand what is the human condition, how changeable is culture. But of course, non-scientists also have a wide range of beliefs that we can also call theories uh, in this way. And so what people believe uh, in all of these different ways and how schools are designed are deeply interlinked. And these have been changing over the history of schools and they will continue to change. And so what we're trying to do is make these sometimes implicit or unconscious or uh, not culturally, not socially explicit processes uh, uh, more available to, to discussion, reflection, and intentional change. 
And so when we think about this history of schooling, again, we can look at, for example, the 7 million years of uh, evolution since our last common ancestor with chimpanzees. And within this, scientists think that uh, human teaching has actually only been going on for maybe a little more than uh, than two million years, around the time of, of the rise of stone tools. Uh, chimpanzees, non-human primates, we see that they do a lot of social learning. They are often learning from each other. They're watching each other and learning from each other, but they're not teaching in the sense that they we haven't observed these non-human primates actually intentionally altering their behavior to improve the performance of, of the student. Uh, so they will learn from each other, but they won't teach each other. And we think that uh, humans have been doing this uniquely within primates uh, uh, for about 2 million years. There are a couple other species that we could discuss that do teaching, but it's very rare in nature. Um, and certainly among the primates, humans seem to be unique. Uh, and uh, within this maybe two plus million year time of teaching, formal education has only existed for about 3,000 years. And only for a little more than 100 years have we actually seen the rise of massively public uh, schooling in the form that we have today. So the the rise of public schooling, the rise of, of mainstream schooling as the dominant source of cultural uh, transmission, cultural change, uh, has been uh, just a very, very recent part of our evolutionary history. And of course, that's what this evolving school survey that you just took is all about. How do we make sense of that? Does that tell us something about the way that schools should be? This is actually a really important and really interesting, but also really controversial area because scientists actually have strong disagreements about how to interpret what this might mean for how we teach and learn. Let's look at what you think. Now, this is just a small sampling of, of data from students that have been taking it in Leipzig um, and maybe a few uh, students internationally. Um, but if we look at this, we can see that uh, if we ask how similar or different is this from your own school? So for students in Germany, especially the self-directed education module, in particular in the survey, you were introduced to the work of Professor Peter Gray, who makes the argument that because during this long period of human evolution, the rise of, of most of modern, of all of modern societies, uh, we didn't have these formal schooling institutions. And that if we look, for example, at, at hunter gathering communities today, we see that they don't have formal teaching uh, in the, um, they don't have formal schooling, um, uh, though they are doing various examples of teaching. Uh, it's quite different than the, than the model of, of, most Western schools. And so Professor Gray controversially argues that we can we should be focused on a self-directed education model or SDE. And this is he, he, while he has many supporters, he also has many critics. And so we don't present this model as a uh, as the model. Uh, we're not promoting it. Were you promoting it as a discussion point for how should we make sense of the evolution of teaching and learning and what does it mean for, uh, for how we design schools? And so in Professor Gray's model of self-directed self education, there is uh, usually no homework, no even set curriculum. Teachers are only uh, generally teaching when students ask them to be uh, ask them to to help learn something. Students are engaged in these mixed aged classrooms instead of segregated by grade. And students have uh, students, in fact, all community members of the school have a full voice in in all of the major decisions of the management of the school itself. 
And so Professor Gray argues that this self-directed model is more in line with our long evolutionary history and therefore better fit for human nature. So we asked you a few questions about how similar to this it was uh, your education, and do you think you would prefer this? Let's look at what you thought. So this is just a sum of the students who have responded by today. Um, uh, but generally what we see, if we look along these dimensions, how similar was your own school, since we're currently asking mostly people from the Western world, we see that almost everyone is having very different schooling experience than this self-directed education. Um, perhaps uh, one that might be a little bit different, students have a vote in all school decisions. So some of you may have attended schools that had a more advanced student participation program. So maybe you had a bit more voice, um, but for the other dimensions, um, this is the SDE model is quite different from the Western model. Um, and this is recognized even by organizations like the OECD, uh, which is an economic cooperation development organization that, uh, that studies school performance. And so they say, for example, that uh, most 21st century students are still being taught by teachers using 20th century pedagogical practices in 19th century school organizations. Um, When we ask you uh, as a student, how much do you think you would have liked this kind of SDE school? Uh, so um, many of you chose uh, the idea that no homework um, and perhaps having more voice would be, uh, would be highly desirable as a student. Um, but things like no required curriculum were had a, a much more diverse opinion. And that's actually with some of you really saying, maybe you wouldn't like this as a student. And actually the same pattern ha happens for, do you think you would like it as a teacher? So this actually reflects a lot of what we find when we give this to other actual school students and actual teachers, uh, specific elements like homework, exams. These are, are often viewed with some skepticism uh, even if there's some value, whereas the idea of no required curriculum is often less well accepted, uh, and we can look at some of the reasons why. And finally, when we ask, what about this idea that the SDE model is a good fit for our human condition, that uh, particularly the blue line, that this is better suited for our human nature, so here we see a much more middle ground and mixed uh, uh, reaction. And there can be many different reasons for this. Many of you have said things such that humans are, of course, social learners, but that there might be individual differences, not for everybody. Uh, others of you have said that we live in a different time than the past. And so this may not still be an adaptive way of learning. Uh, and still others may think that uh, when we ask this among other students, uh, we've done this as young as seventh grade and, uh, and with students in different countries in, in Western contexts. And interestingly, even very young students have a, a somewhat nuanced view of the origins of schooling, believing that schools and formal teaching have evolved in relation to societal complexity. Uh, and so that's this idea that while humans may have evolved to learn one way, society is dynamic and changing itself. And so it may not be the case that, uh, that what was good in the past is, is good for today. And that is one of the scientific critiques of, of Peter Gray's work. Interestingly, while we find uh, very rarely are people fully endorsing Peter Gray's self-directed education model, what is almost universal in these Western, when we do the interviews among Western populations, is the idea that we should try to maximize autonomy and therefore have a minimal structure but still have some structure. So people will say that 
it's good. We should try to give students freedom, but they point to the idea that uh, not all students have the same maybe family resources. They may have uh, different individual differences in their disposition or personality, um, and uh, and even students with the best possible situation, family situation, or the highest motivation may still need uh, some level of curriculum structure to help uh, truly survive and thrive in the modern era. And so what we find is that while people have different beliefs about what this minimal structure is, there is a pretty widespread agreement, a almost universal among Western uh, citizens, uh, an almost universal theory of schooling that we should try to maximize freedom uh, with the limits of creating a minimal curriculum structure. And disagreement then uh, lies within what does it mean minimal? Different people will say different things. Some people have told us all students, only math should be required, or others will say only reading and writing should be required, or people will say uh, that we need a well-rounded uh, exposure. General knowledge should be provided and, and in some way required. And so people have different views on what constitutes this minimal structure, um, but we find that this concept of minimal structure for maximal autonomy is, is almost universal agreement among uh, non-scientific uh, or not formally scientific uh, views on 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 how we should optimize school. And interestingly, we're beginning to develop this as a cross-cultural project, including in communities where schooling is just emerging. For example, the Bayaka community within the Congo uh, is uh, a community that has been uh, engaged in hunting, hunting and gathering uh, for as long as been documented, and only recently have, have schools come in. And uh, not surprisingly, this is both an opportunity, but also creating real challenges. And so when we think about uh, uh, Peter Gray's model of saying that all humans should learn as hunter-gatherers, it becomes a particularly interesting and challenging uh, issue when actual hunter-gatherer communities are beginning to send their children to modern schools. And so in this context, discussing what are our theories of schooling, we believe can be a kind of universal uh, process for making explicit what we think we're doing, what kinds of, of content, what kinds of school processes, what kind of school design elements uh, will help us get to where we want to go. So we hope that gives you a taste of what this Evolving Schools project is. We're asking really big questions. What kinds of schools and curriculum do students need for today's world? What's the relationship between freedom and structure in education? How individualized should education be? What should all students learn about? And this sets us up for next week's module on next week's uh, content area on education for sustainable development or ESD, which really requires us to think about these big questions as we try to reform and redesign global school curriculum. So we look forward to talking to you next week. Thanks for joining us.